Okay, everyone, let's uh, get started. Welcome back to this afternoon's session. We have a panel with uh, Jane Fever, Polly Stenham, and Jess Swale. We have as its title, The Potentiality of Childhood, a title that's suggestive but also capacious. Uh, each person on the panel is going to be speaking for about 10 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to a conversation among the panel members and the audience. And this is, of course, an ongoing conversation that we're having over these days, so feel free in asking questions to make points of connection and uh, intersection between what's been said here and what's been said in the previous talks. So Jane is going to begin. Over to you, Jane. It. Oh, there. Right. Hello. Um, it is lovely to be here. I should say that first of all. It's a huge treat. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I wanted to start just by plunging in and talking about the importance of reconnecting to the child in us all. That's my thing. And I'm just going to come out with a sort of a raft of stuff and see what you make of it. Some of which I think does connect with stuff that was said this morning or was said last night, um, but we'll see. Um, anyway, and I have to do funny things with my specs because of my terrible eyesight. Um, so I'll begin. Society pushes at us with the idea that childhood is a condition that will grow out of. We're urged to grow up, to, um, to, to become like adults, to put away childish things. It's as if it's a one-way street. But, as we've seen from this morning's talks, apart from anything else, you don't have to look far among artists and writers, we had priests um, and poets particularly, to find there's a counter-imperative. I want to start by reading a letter um, by the poet Ted Hughes, who, uh, sort of extraordinarily, I think, he's not unique in this, but he wrote sort of almost equally for children, that's sometimes forgotten, and wrote wonderfully for children. And he also wrote amazing letters, and one of these is to his son Nicholas, who um, wrote to his father expressing some anxiety about feeling childish, this as an adult. And Ted said, Nicholas, don't you know about people this first and most crucial fact? Every single one is, and is painfully every moment aware of it, still a child. Everybody develops a whole armor of secondary self, the artificially constructed being that deals with the outer world and the crush of circumstances. That might feel a bit familiar, I don't know. Um, he goes on to characterize this inner child as a little creature sitting there behind the armor, peering through the slits. And he says, in fact, that child is the only real thing. When that child gets buried, under their protective shells, the carapace we build around ourselves, then he becomes, Hugh says, one of the walking dead, a monster. He's quite, you know, this is a huge thing to say. Um, we've talked a little bit about recognizing the importance of um, evoking childhood in a spirit of playfulness, I think. But it's very important, I think, to acknowledge that that doesn't preclude the dark and the deep and the urgent sense of reconnecting to that child. Um, there's a necessity to make a connection with a creature whose outlook is untrammeled by schooling, by the sort of institutional grooming we all receive through our education, through our social, political, economic circumstances and conformity. Um, at its extreme, this allows us to street sleepwalk through our lives. It might indeed turn us into monsters. Um, I was looking at, at, to find other examples of this sort of precise thing on Hughes's wavelength, and I found this wonderful poet who I hadn't come across before called Edith Sodogran, who's Finnish. Does anyone, I don't know whether anyone else knows her, but anyway, I thought this poem was wonderful. I'm just gonna read a bit of it. It's called My Childhood Trees, and in it she envisages the trees from her childhood addressing her now as an adult, and they're shaking their heads at her, and they're asking her what has become of you. You've be they, and this is a quote from the poem. You've become a human, alien and hateful, as a child, you talked with us for hours. Your eyes were wise. Now we'd like to tell you the secret of your life. The key to all secrets lies in the grass by the raspberry patch. We want to shake you up, you sleeper. We want to wake you, dead one, from your sleep. Poets know and acknowledge the importance of being allowed to just stand and stare. Your son was 
was, was showing you this. And, and this sense of sort of non-hierarchical view of what's important and what isn't, they value um, and extol the sensibility of childhood, the child as father to the man. Um, Coleridge talks about, uh, he says, to carry on the feelings of childhood into the powers of manhood, this is the sort of greatest thing. This is sort of a mark of genius. It's combining the child's sense of wonder and, no and novelty with appearances that we've just grown up with and grown used to. So poets are one thing. Praise writers can appear to be more entrammeled, I think. They're less willing to shoulder off the burden or the privileges of being an adult. They're less willing to play the game. I'm largely a writer of prose. Um, and I want to evoke here, though, a writer that goes against this wonderfully, um, a writer I love called Sylvia Townsend Warner, who died in about 1976. She lived quite a long life. Um, she was a, an extraordinary woman. She lived in Dorset, so seemed to live a very sort of parochial, buried life, but actually had a very international outlook. She went off to fight in the Spanish Civil War. She was published in the New Yorker regularly. She was an intellectual, but she wasn't university educated. She was a great scholar of music. She translated Proust. Um, she was amazing. Anyway, in 1959, she was asked to give a lecture to the Royal Society of Arts called Women as Writers. She was very playful. She talked perversely about the historic advantages of being a woman. She says she feels sorry for men because of their heavier equipment of learning and self-consciousness. Women, she says, because they find, for the very fact that they find themselves in a humbler situation, you know, they're, they're put off with the children and they talk to the sort of low life and they talk to the tradesmen, that they've, been, they've got a much greater facility with the language, with the sort of demotic language. Um, they're able to do two things at once, we all know that. Well, I can't, but most women can. Um, when she imagines this great and exclusive literary party going on at the palace with the men, popping corks, um, playing tunes, having a great time, she imagines that the women get into that party by climbing into the pantry window. So very much like children, she, they, she's identifying women with children. They creep in. And this is a great way of entering the party. And they, they I'm going to quote her, they've entered literature breathless, unequipped, with nothing but their wits to trust to. No one has groomed them for a literary career. That word grooming again. So the so-called advantage, she says, derives from their circumstance, this circumstance of being born into this situation, not from their sex. So she's generous enough to allow that some men also have this lovely advantage, and she puts Shakespeare among them. Um, so sometimes we need reminding of our native wit. And I'm just going to have a little drink. Um, it's ironic, I teach at a university, and I'd say a lot of the students I teach are sort of 18 to 21, and weirdly, you'd think that they'd be more in touch with their childhoods as nearer to it, but perversely, they're not. They're desperate to prove they're not children anymore, they're educated, they know, you know, they've been schooled in prefrontal adverbs and wow words and, and prescribed vocabularies. They've got a real resistance to play. They're very defensive about what they know. And so, but what I'm trying to do, very, at the very, when I first get them into my hands, I'm essentially trying to take them back to a pre-educated state. And I do this in a very simple way, and it's not, you know, lots of writers will say that this is a very important thing, and I just say to them, look, just, just like an electric circuit, switch on, let's say, your five senses, there's probably millions more, but let's just switch them all on one by one. It's surprisingly difficult to recall them all at once if you have to, but we'll try, uh, let's try. I've got them written down. <laughs> Sight is easy. Touch, taste, scent, feeling. That are, I've repeated myself, I know, but you know what I mean. And there's a, we might allow a sixth one. And then, of course, they're very broad, broad categories. Um, and there's the all in between. But have them all in mind and then switch them on. And then make yourself not a child, because if you ask teenagers or young adults to imagine being a child, they are immediately, as we've, we were discussing this, they sentimentalize, they cutify children, and also they lobotomize them, they make them thick. Children aren't thick, they're much cleverer than all of us, their brains are huge. Um, so I get them instead to think of being an animal, be an animal, and you're new to the world. Um, you, your, all your senses are on high alert. 
If they're anxious about the fact that they're not learning anything from me because they think this is ridiculous, I will tell them about Shklovsky. Shklovsky, that's how I pronounce it. Um, the Russian formalist, he talks about this thing of defamiliarization, um, which is essentially what Coleridge is talking about. The wonder, of, the wonder of childhood, getting back that feeling of the strangeness of coming to the world for the first time. Um, in art as technique, Shlosky says, he described, he described, where he describes this, this process of estrangement, defamiliarization, he says he, the need for it is because as perception becomes habitual, it becomes automatic. So we're lazy creatures, and as we're educated in the ways, the smooth-tongued ways of the world, we speak in cliches because it's easier to speak in cliches. He says a wonderful thing. He says, art exists that one may recover the sensation of life. It exists to make one feel things, to make the stone stony. So it's an artist's duty to make the world anew, to reinvent it every time, to reinvent the way we talk about it every time. Um, I'm coming near the end now. I think I'm all right of time. It's not surprising to me that late in life, Sylvia Townsend was asked whether she was a communist, which it seemed that she was. She'd signed up to the Communist Party. She'd gone off to the Spanish Civil War, or an anarchist. And she chose to say, with great glee, I'm an anarchist, basically because anarchists have much more fun. She says, if you're an anarchist, your life is one long excitement. I think that writers and artists of all type need to cultivate this childlike sense of anarchy. They need to develop a nose for disruption, anything that shakes us up from our sleep. I want to leave you with uh, a specific example of this. So last, I'm a university lecturer, and in England last year, and maybe in the whole of the country actually, lecturers went on strike. And normally strikes are boring, you know, nothing much happens, a couple of people turn up on the picket line because lecturers do not strike. This time, they did. And it was a sort of unexpectedly glorious moment because suddenly there was this amazing space, a liminal space of the picket line, which grew and grew and grew every day. And all the people that were manning, manning the picket line were the people from the, within, the, within the institution. But they were doing things that they don't normally do in the institution, i.e. they were singing, dancing, cooking for each other, knitting, hugging, <laughs> laughing, talking to each other, um, having ideas. <laughs> sort of extraordinary things were happening. And also, as they were talking to each other, they started discovering that each one of them felt, in the institution, fear, anxiety, imposter syndrome, <laughs> All those things, they'd been atomized in their own little boxes. So it was an extraordinary moment of sort of comradeship and freedom and very creatively gen generative, if that's the word, generative. It jolted us out of an accustomed and a terrible way of being, as we discovered. And then the very extraordinary thing is that when we were due to go back to work twice in a row, it snowed in England, and it snowed so badly that the campus was shut off, so we couldn't go back to work. So it was as if the sort of hand of God came down and said, yes, I'm just going to extend this a little bit. And then the effect of that snow was exactly the same as the strike, really. It got people out into the street in a sort of childlike wonder and amazement at the world. Um, and I ended up writing a poem about it, so that's what I'm just going to end with. And you might see a nod to that armour of Hughes's in there at the end. So it's very short, and it's called Strike. Twice in a row, the night before the day we're due to return to work, it snows. Takes us, blinking from our doorsteps, by surprise, the aftermath of a blitz. Can it be coincidence? The glare of white is not so much familiar as reminiscent, the stuff of childhood bundled up when every year it seemed to us it snowed. The lanes are thick with it again, cars like igloos, school is shut. Straggles of children trudge with plastic sledges to the steepest field. They shriek and dive. What luck to not be doing the thing we'd all be doing had it not snowed, learning as outcome, teaching for gold, etc. An end to stultifying jargon. I'm trying to tell you how it was. That picket, it was like the snow, a chance to stop, to breathe, which we embraced like samurais, 
who've been unlaced, unbolted from their armor after years and lifted out. We hardly recognize ourselves, but rush to fill our boots up while we can. Joy, daring, weightlessness, abandon. Uh, that was wonderful. It was a hard act to follow. Um, ooh, wow, it's loud. There we go. Hi. So I'm a playwright by trade, so I don't generally do these kind of talks, well, occasionally, but not that often. So when I was kind of musing on this title, I think what I've written is a kind of slightly deranged internal monologue that might not entirely connect that well, but go with it. Just go with it. It'll be fine. So, right, Potential of the Child. So, when I was researching this title, I came across a word I hadn't heard before, and I'm actually not entirely sure if I'm going to pronounce this right. Feel free to correct me, if anyone knows. Neotony? Neotony? Anyone know? Neotony. Yes, okay, great. Um, so, apparently this means the retention of immature qualities into adulthood, which I thought was just the most amazing word. I discovered in quite some time. Completely wonderful. And apparently, human beings are, of all creatures, the most... Let's try this word again. Neotonous. <laughs> the most connected to our maturity. So, by that reckoning, I would say the potential of the child, which is our vague title of this, is sort of always with us, is it not? If we always retain those qualities as, as creatures. But when I really think about childhood and being a child, I suppose like many of us do, I sort of, I think about play. Ooh, there we go, blowing the microphone. Um, and I think about how, despite the creativity and privilege of my job as a playwright, which is an amazingly creative thing to do, I think I've really sort of lost play from my life. I don't know how many people feel that. And I was starting to think, you know, what, what is it? Because if your job is sort of make-believe and building these structured realities with all the costumes and all the stuff and, you know, like, very serious play, basically, and it's also literally called a play, and I started going down a rabbit hole on that, um, it just started to make me think, like, what, what to play? Like, what, what is that? And, yeah, so I looked it up, which I don't think I'd done before, and the definition of play is a pleasurable activity undertaken for no apparent purpose. It's like, wow. Seems really obvious. <laughs> but anyhow. And then I got thinking about no apparent purpose. And I was like, no apparent purpose, no apparent purpose. When was the last time many of us did something for no apparent purpose? Like, for really, for no purpose. And it's not... And I don't consider myself an entirely productive person. But... It's not that often something is done without an end to itself. And this got me thinking more. So when did we actively sort of stop playing, which is one of the, the key things about being a child? When did it get so, so like completely serious all the time? And if we're actually such neotonous <laughs> creatures, is it good for us? If, that's our in if it's innate in us to retain immature qualities, therefore to retain playfulness, is it actually good for our health that we don't really play anymore? And I started thinking about my own mental health and my friend's mental health. And really sadly, I lost a friend to depression this year. And so I've been thinking a lot about what makes people happy and what doesn't. And I wonder if the potential for play we had as children and losing this side of ourselves are actually the consequences of that cognitively sort of spiritually, emotionally, sort of serious. It's like, is losing the silly actually quite serious? And I think, I think we kind of shame play. It's weird, isn't it? We sort of shame it out of ourselves as a species. Like, if you look culturally at kind of how we treat the kind of the, the train spotter or the stamp collector or the comic collector or the gamer, you know, we sort of ridicule that kind of play in popular culture. We're not kind about it, actually. It's geeky, it's this, it's that. But actually, is the joke sort of on us? You know, must everything have a goal or a purpose? 
but is maybe not to have a purpose really purposeful, which I understand is a weird sort of circular thing, but I was like, wow, maybe it is. Anyway, so a phrase I kept coming across during this research was the opposite of play isn't work, it's in fact oppression. I thought this was really interesting and actually really kind of heartbreaking. So we shame this play out of ourselves. Everything must have a purpose. And I think this is probably, I'm sure most of us would agree, sort of driven by our neoliberalist, consumer-orientated, post-industrialist, post-industrial capitalist culture, which has led many of us to feel tired, serious, afraid, and joyless. Because if everything, if we've got to keep consuming, everything has to have an end goal, doesn't it? And that's so, like, stitched into the way we've built the world, which is, again, actually really sad. Um, and I started looking at mental health statistics, which is always a mistake. Um, there was, you'll be relieved to know, a record number of antidepressants prescribed last year, and suicide is now the leading cause of death in 20 to 34 age group nationally. So something's going seriously wrong, isn't it? If we're honest. And I started thinking, like, in denying the playfulness and the childlike and the being able to do stuff for no reason, for no sake, with no agenda, that sort of creates an altered state, doesn't it? And are altered states really important, maybe even crucial for mental health? Because they're sort of safety valve for the mind, aren't they? A way to release something. And I started looking more at statistics that and sort of serious suppression of play in, a ch in children can lead to quite kind of bad violent behavior when they're older, which was interesting also. And then I stumbled across an experiment that I was like thrilled about. You know, when you find something that you know you're gonna be repeating loads <laughs> in rather random conversations because it's quite satisfying. So check out this experiment that kind of proves this sort of general theory about play that maybe is true. So it's, it was called the rat-cat experiment. So basically, they had like two groups of rats, adolescent rats. So one group of rats was allowed to be normal and like play fight and do all the ratty stuff that rats do. The other group was not allowed to play with each other. I don't know how they made that happen, but they did. So there's group one, the happy, playful, normal rats. Group two, weren't allowed to socialize or play. So then they gave both of these groups a cat saturated collar to smell. And programmed into them biologically is to flee. If you smell the cat, the rats hide. But what happened is really interesting. So the group that were allowed to play and develop normally, they would hide from the rat collar, but then eventually come back out. And the group that weren't allowed to play hid, and they never came back out. They died in hiding. Isn't that awful? But it's so, it's poor rats, poor ratty guys. Um, but it sort of proves something, doesn't it? That essentially play obviously teaches us a lot about managing fear and trust and connection. And as we have the same neurotransmitters and similar cortical architecture to rats, the experiment proves that play is important to our survival. I've now got some quotes about play. <laughs> some of the greatest thinkers in human history are the biggest advocate of play. Einstein, play is the highest form of research. I like that one. Spielberg, I dream for a living. J.K. Rowling, I write what amuses me. It is totally for myself. Oh, I think that's brilliant. You can tell, can't you, I think, in her work. And then Plato, life must be lived as play. Interestingly, we actually used to play more as adults. If you look at a 15th century picture of a courtyard, you'll see all kinds of play, like all kinds of just all ages, just hanging out, playing in the courtyard. Balls and darts and archery and, you know, all that stuff. Um, and I wonder, I, and this is me having no idea what I'm talking about. This is like just an internal thought that could be completely wrong. But I was like, is, was that sort of a feudal time? And presumably since then, we've moved more from the sort of feudal and the landed to the industrial and the city. Has the currency, I guess our currency of time has changed, hasn't it? Like how we spend our time. And that's clearly affected play. Anyway. So 
the currency of play. I mean, surely the biggest currency of play, and I'm sure a lot of topics have touched on this, there's a lot of artists here talking about this kind of thing, is what it does for creativity. And I started to think that if, like, if play is doing stuff without purpose, with no end goal, there's a sort of insane freedom in that. And also, it's sort of, if it's a freedom from kind of the tyranny of purpose, is it also freedom from, well, relief even, from the tyranny of just trying to survive? Just getting from A to B. I mean, you know, whether you're hunting in a sort of forest or a waitrose or whatever you're doing. Do you know what I mean? If you're not having to engage with that, and what now, what now, what now? And it's that space, isn't it, where the imagination really flourishes when you're not riddled with the anxiety of the next, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. And then I had a really, like, funny memory of my sister playing on her own. And she used to do this thing, I was thinking about, she's a writer as well, and thinking about creativity and play. And I used to come into a room when she was really, it's like five or six, and she'd be sat on her own. And she did this like all the time, it was amazing. She'd be sat on her own, like talking to a book. It was the most beautiful thing. She'd be like talking to it, like it was talking to her. It was amazing, the inner outer world thing I was seeing. And that made me think about kind of solo play and how unbelievably important that is and how it's really sad that we sort of shame that out of ourselves and that, you know, it's almost considered a sign of being slightly insane now. I mean, if you found me talking to a book in a corner, I mean, what would you really think? It probably wouldn't be good. Maybe it'll happen, who knows. But anyway, I started thinking about that and the kind of absolute staggering beauty of the innocence and unawareness of doing something like that. And how that kind of play, I mean, exploring the boundaries of our inner and outer worlds and it, that playful curiosity that drives us to, ex to explore, interact and make these weird unexpected connections. And they are in actually the total hotbed of creativity. Like I think in that moment, I almost maybe knew she'd be an artist seeing her do that, I don't know. Anyway, oh, I've no idea how long I've spoken for, whatever, but this is all I've got. Um, I'll just round off with a kind of, my last paragraph. I was sort of thinking as our world becomes increasingly challenging, which it is, obviously, with technology and Trump and all sorts of really scary stuff's going on. It seems that we as a race, probably more than ever, need to develop a sense of creativity and cooperation. Those two seem to be the two things we really need at the moment, more than ever. I'm sure every generation thinks that, but it definitely feels true. And I wondered actually if, if more play in our lives could be the key to these capacities, because that's the thing that play fosters. And then, yeah, I mean, I just, I think it's not frivolous. Play is not frivolous, it's essential. And the times perhaps it seems the least appropriate to play, it might be the most urgent. I mean, it can really be used to heal, I think. And the things it creates, like creativity, fellowship and wonder, you know, how could we not want much more of that in our life? Yeah, I'm done. Hi, folks. Um, I'm going to mess things up by going to the lectern. Is that cool if I do that now? Yeah. I don't think I need that. Um, but I might do, because I might just, you know, improvise. Who knows? Anything could happen. Hi, thanks for having me back. It's lovely to be here. Um, it's a bit magical, really, isn't it, on this island? The first time I thought, oh, I wonder if it's a little bit like that Agatha Christie book where everyone turns up on the island and one by one they disappear. <laughs> That's my play brain. I spend quite a lot of time in that place, thankfully. In fact, where's Jacob? Maybe he's the first one down. Um, don't think so. Who knows? It's exciting. Uh, not death. Murder is not exciting. Um, but books are. My name's Jess Swale. I'm a screenwriter and a playwright and a drama mongrel 
basically, I make stuff up for a living, which is a great pleasure. Because I get to play all the time. Peter Brook uh, said that a play is play. It's what we've been talking about. And it is. It's what we do in the act of making theatre. It's make-believe. And it's an absolute fostering of the imagination on everybody's part. Partly the actors, obviously, you're pretending to be somebody else. But there's something really exciting, I think, in the fact that we're asking an audience of quite often serious people to sit in a room and just accept that the people in front of them aren't the people in front of them. They're entirely different people in an entirely different scenario. There's something about the sort of communal act of childlike abandon that theatre fosters in an audience as well as in the participants, which is one of the reasons I love doing it. But as a dramatist, we get to go even deeper into that because we spend our whole lives pretending playing someone else, pretending to be someone else, shaking off critically the confines of the real, the everyday, to go somewhere that, frankly, we find more interesting. I don't want to write about my personal experience. I would rather pretend to be somebody else and explore that. And it's that sort of curiosity that I think you have from when you're very young. But in order to do that, in order to bridge that and find that childlike creativity, not only do we have to act like a child in terms of trusting uh, curiosity and our imagination and taking risks, going to war on risk, like um, uh, Simon spoke about this morning. Uh, but we also have to be able to access what we had when we were a child and our experience. Um, Madeline Longle said that I'm still every age that I've ever been. Because I was once a child, I am always a child. Because I was once a searching adolescent, given to moods and ecstasies, these are still part of me and always will be. They are there in me to be drawn on. To forget them is a form of suicide. So maybe that's what we're doing as creative people, is putting off uh, an early death. And Tom Stoppard said, if you carry your childhood with you, you never become older. Which I think is rather lovely. You do have to, though, fight against this feeling of rigidity in terms of what's expected of you. Stanislavski, the uh, great Russian uh, art maker, said intellectual analysis, and I'm sorry for the philosophers and uh, academics amongst us. Uh, he was quite critical of that sort of, uh, a particular way of thinking, but... He said, intellectual analysis, if undertaken by itself for its own right, for its own sake, is harmful because its mathematical dry qualities tend to chill an impulse of artistic elan and creative enthusiasm. If the results of scholarly analysis are thought, the results of artistic analysis are feeling. And that is what we trade in, feeling. I've had to learn as an adult making this sort of work to trust my feelings because you can only be original if you really forget the rules and tap into the wildness and the rebel and the risk. What I love more than anything else is the what if. When I was at primary school, I used to have two different fantasies. I had lots of different fantasies, but just to share these two with you. One was that during a maths class, which was by far my worst subject, a man would come through the window on a flying horse, swoop down and pick me up from my table, and out of the window I would go with him. And I would be the coolest, coolest kid in the class because I'd gone out the window on the magical horse. I loved that fantasy because it was a chance for me to find something imaginatively better than the reality. But of course, you also have the fantasy world, which is the worse reality. And it's something that we haven't really talked about yet. We've talked about the greatness of play and the um, innocence of it. But actually, children and their dark imaginations, the what if, where things are horrible, and that's a really, really critical part of both what we do as dramatists and what children do. I read a quote this morning saying that childhood is about people not accepting death and not engaging with death. I don't think that's right. I think children are obsessed with death and obsessed with darkness and trying to work it out and work out um, what it can possibly mean. The other fantasy I used to have is that I was standing in front of a group of people doing something very serious 
and wearing totally inappropriate clothes. I found it really scary. The idea of, for example, like I am right now, standing here being asked to be taken seriously, but instead of wearing my normal safe blue trousers, I would be wearing something mad. Like, for example, something truly embarrassing, like... <laughs> the worst shorts you've ever seen, Lycra 1980s cycling shorts. And somehow, I would expect still to be taken seriously by everybody, despite the fact I had ridiculous clothes on. There's some sort of safety here in the fact I'm slightly protected. I could have worn them and you would never have known, but I decided to share because that is the risk. And that's the risk you take as a writer is saying, here's something within me that is a bit scary, but hell, I'm going to say it anyway because who cares? Children don't ask all the time to be, um, to, to get sort of affirmation from other people. Sometimes it's just about being true to yourself. So that's what I'm doing right now. Um, a few years ago, I was offered a rather an unusual chance, a commission to write a film which, for the first time in my life, instead of either being based on an idea that I'd pitched or that a studio had said, can you do this? It was the first time ever that I'd been asked to do something where they said, you can do what you want. You can start from scratch. But... You, you cannot come to us with something that you've already got. You have to start with a totally blank page. So I had to ask myself really for the first time what I really wanted to write about if I could just start from nothing. And what would those themes be? What really, really fascinated me? And what I came up with was childhood and imagination what it means to be an underdog, what it means to be small, and what magic is, because those are the things that are the reason why I'm a writer. It's a film about a woman for, for reasons that she doesn't know at the beginning. Has, she has tried to squash the childhood and the imagination and the love uh, out of her life. She's a folklore historian, but her job is to work out what the reality is behind folklore stories and crush the magic with science. And in a slightly anarchic act, rather than talking seriously about my theories of play, I thought I would just read you a little bit of the script to demonstrate this. And the reason why I have really enjoyed writing this is because not only do I get to write the voice of a child and the voice of an adult who's lost her childhood, but how do those two things manifest in both characters. Actually, the innocent child, a bit like Jane said, wise children, the innocent child often is the wiser of the two because they don't try and plan and think too much. Part of childhood is about the freedom of being honest and truthful without all of the baggage of what adults teach you to try and understand. So there's a scene in the film where Frank is wiser than anybody amongst the adults com community has been. And likewise, Alice, the adult, has moments where she's more like a child than a conventional adult. And that's what I've really enjoyed as a writer. We sort of assume this is how you write a child, this is how you write an adult, but it's when you mess up those things that you get something interesting. This is just, I just, we do, uh, we haven't got much, how are we doing for time? Great, brilliant. Okay. Um, the film is set in the 1940s and Alice lives uh, on a house on the beach on her own. She's 30-something and she's cantankerous and she has an evacuee delivered to her that she doesn't want because she's far too busy working and she doesn't like kids. Alice is looking through photographs. She picks up a photograph of an Italian town and compares it to another picture, nearly identical, but in this picture, a town hangs ghost-like in the air above the first town. She pins them to a map on the wall. Pan out to reveal a crime lab style wall, a collection of images, notes, strings, linking pictures and places. The door bangs. Shoes off! Frank pokes his head round the door, his eyes widening. Don't even think about disturbing me. No. He watches the door. She pins the second image to the map. Where's that? 
Reggio in Calabria, Italy, what? It's floating. No, it isn't. It just looks like it is. But it is. I thought I told you to leave me alone. How do you know it isn't? Because they're buildings made of stone. They can't just hang in the air. Have you heard of physics? It's not real. But it's a photograph. Yes, but... But there's a perfectly rational explanation. What? Well, perhaps I would have worked it out if you'd only leave me alone. Go on, out! He leaves. She looks back at the photograph. He returns. Magic? She kicks the door closed, shutting him out, returns to her work. But something niggles. She picks up the photograph again. Later on, they're having dinner, and he's seen a spooky mask on the wall. And he asks what it is. She tells him, a chibati, Indian marsh spirit. You find them round the salt flats in Gujarat. They're not real, though. Oh, they are, she says. Haven't you ever seen a marsh spirit? Balls of light hovering around at night? Because the longer she gets to know him, the more she starts to engage in the play, even though she doesn't accept magic at all. She starts to enjoy playing with him and what he believes and what he doesn't. You should look out for them, he, she says. They're all over the place. Min Min's in Australia, Bruyas in Mexico. You know what the Colombians call them? What? Candelilla. Evil grandmothers doomed to wander the earth, tortured souls. See what I mean about women living on their own with cats. They're not in England, though, are they? Oh, yeah, more than anywhere. Wait till it's dark, then go to a churchyard and keep your eyes on the gravestones. They'll come. But when they do, don't get too close. It'll flit away. Then when you follow, it'll get quicker and quicker until ha, you're in the bog, drowned, and that's the end of you. Frank pales. She smiles to herself. Willow the wisps, Frank. It's just marsh gas, that's all. Iridescence from chemicals that make heat. It's why you find them around graveyards, gas from decomposing bodies. But you said they lead you away. <clears throat> Imagine there's a pool with a leaf floating on it. Then you jump in. What happens? I get told off to the water. It gets wavy. And the leaf, if you swim towards it, it floats away. Exactly. Move towards the gas and it disperses, reforms further off. It's science. <laughs> Willow the wisps. Frank eyes the mask warily and rapidly finishes his dinner. Can I get down now? She flicks her head to the door in consent. He heads out, shutting the door behind him. Something falls. Alice looks up. It's the mask, fallen from the wall. She freezes. Of all the... Of course, there's no such thing as magic, is there? And uh, as, as the story progresses, she, we see a little bit more of the fact that she, where her sort of um, experience comes from. It was interesting listening to Jennifer talking about uh, the experience of having something in your childhood which affects you when you're an adult. She is... Um, very hurt by what happened to her 10 years earlier um, when she was left by her lover. And she's climbing the hill with Frank. He's tried to make a plane and uh, it broke, so she's made him make another one. And he says as they're walking up the hill, what if it breaks? And the thing about Alice is that even though she's an adult, she's unconventional. And part of that is about defying the conventions of what we imagine to be good parenting, good motherhood. She isn't good at talking to children because she doesn't really understand what are the expectations. So he asks her, what if it breaks? She says, let me tell you something. Life's not kind. Anguish is inevitable. Your heart will break. Your friends will die. You may even think about killing yourself. Planes will crash, Frank. What matters is how you deal with it. What if it crashes? Well, what if it crashes? I'll build another one. Well then, what are you waiting for? She walks away and then turns to see Frank hurtling towards the edge. He loses his footing. Frank! She tackles him to the ground just in time. 
They watch the plane arc elegantly over the sky and then smash onto the sand below. Worth it? Yeah. They sit. She takes out a flask and pours them tea. Why don't you have a husband? Why don't you have a wife? You think I need a husband? Did you ever have one? There was someone once. Who? It's in the past now. Did you get married? No. Why not? What is this? 20 questions? He blows on his tea. And as she looks to the beach, shards of a memory rise up. And it's only later on that, coming back to Jane's theme of um, children not being thick, children sometimes being the wisest of all, Frank is outside the house. And I wanted to write something where we really saw how wise a young child can be and how perceptive. Twi twilight. The moon casts a silver glow on the wooden slats of the house. Frank lays places at a makeshift outdoor table. Alice brings out a stew. Frank hovers, looking at something inside. Can I put some music on? That old thing hasn't worked for years. Frank appears with a record. Alice stiffens. Put it back. What is it? Put it back. Frank, shocked, does as he's told, and then sits down quietly. Hand me your plate, Frank. Sorry, it's just... It was a gift, that's all. From who? A lady. A friend. It's a good tune. Is she the one you loved? Alice stops serving and looks at him. Why do you say that, Frank? Would you think it was strange if a woman loved another woman? Suddenly immensely vulnerable, she looks at him. He thinks. No. Unexpectedly, momentously, the tide of emotion breaks. The weight of secrecy, judgment, agony, loss, all for a moment redeemed by the compassion and innocence of a small boy. Tears flood. I'm sorry, it's just... Alice sobs. Frank is bewildered. It's not... You didn't... It's just... People... Most people think it's wicked. Why? I don't know. They think it's a sin to love someone that we should burn in hell. It's not as bad as marrying someone you don't like. She smiles at the wise and surprising boy. Do they argue at home? Sometimes. Sometimes they just go quiet. Did you kiss her? How would you feel if I said yes? Don't know then yes. How was that? All right. Was it on the lips? Mostly. Eat up, your stew's getting cold. And that is the uh, first ever sharing of that film. Um, uh, just to finish extremely briefly with a quote from Dr. Zeus, who's one of my heroes, he said, adults are just obsolete children and the hell with them. Hello. That was that was really beautiful and and um, very like um, uh, diverse perspectives on the potentiality of childhood. So that was really cool. And um, I, uh, when you were talking about play and um, how important it is that we continue to play even as we're adults, I was I was reflecting back on when I was a child. And I think that I, I kind of wished my childhood away after a certain point that um, I think I realized the turning point last night at dinner, but you know, this is what this event will do for you. Um, and, uh, but, but more to the point here about um, when you do play wrong as a kid and when there are um, like, um, when you break the rules that like other children set up and um, and it kind of doesn't, I don't know, doesn't, it doesn't go right. And I wonder if there's some kind of reluctance to allow ourselves to be vulnerable um, 
uh, in, in getting it wrong. And so I don't know if you, if you have any thoughts generally about like um, the insecurity of uh, how we might, I don't know, I haven't really thought through this question or comment until I am sat here in this moment, but um, the, the, the darkness that can come from it and uh, like allowing, um, allowing that to be as we explore play as adults. Yeah? Hello. Um, I, I, are you sort of talking about shame? The shame in kind of getting play wrong? Is that, is that where we're going? Yeah, 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 maybe. I guess like uh, when, um, w when like, a, yeah, a, a proposition is made, say, as mm. a, a child, and then like all, and, and, and like a bunch of kids are engaging in this proposition. Mm. And then, you know, one kid is like, no, you, you're supposed to be able, you can't fly. You're, you've got this power or whatever. And then suddenly possibilities start like breaking down. And mm. then, um, and how, like the dysfunction of, of that. And it's not an entirely pleasurable experience sometimes. I, I, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think sort of, it's been touched on a bit here, yeah, the idea of the, the darker side of play, which I didn't actually go down at all, and now I kind of regret that, because that's really interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, sh shame is a horrible, horrible feeling, isn't it? Isn't the difference between shame and embarrassment? It's, embarrassment's about something you did, shame's about what you are. I think someone told me that. Mm. Is there a weird reverb on my mic? Something's happening. <laughs> um... But yeah, I agree. I think it's probably those moments that are the beginning of our brains just narrowing and us becoming smaller and more frightened people, which ironically are the adults we become. But yeah, I, I, I agree with you. There's nothing... It's quite sort of Darwinian, all that, isn't it? Yeah. Kids just being mean to each other. But it's also... Um, and you'll know this, having been to drum... Is it, this is on, isn't it? Hello, good. Um... Having been to drama school, there's quite a famous game called Yes And, where what you encourage in whether you're working with a four-year-old uh, actor or with a group of 40-year-olds in a therapy centre is, is the positivity of possibility and the fact there is no wrong answer. So in that game, first of all, you block. So someone says, how about this? And you say no, and your improvisation goes nowhere, and it's always a no because this. And then the, in the next round, you extend it, and you say yes, but... So and so. So you twist something, so you take the original person's idea and then you make it your own. And the final round, which is the truly encouraging one, you always say yes and. And the point is that wherever it ends up is fine. So it could be, let's go to the sea, and the next person says, yes, and then we'll go to the moon. Uh, it's not really a great next scenario, but it doesn't matter. You're on the moon because someone said that, and you build on. And that's something that we really... Um, often limit ourselves on as adults and actually a lot of the time as writers and I think it's something we have to react against I find particularly with screenwriting you get notes all the time from studios saying you know originally they love your idea and then by the time it's coming to near shooting a movie they'll want it to be box ticking and it has to be in this shape because that's like that other movie which made lots of money and therefore they wanted to be like that. And it's very, very easy for creativity, even in a really creative job, to be completely stifled by all of those, um, the shapings and the workings of expectations of what a creative thing should be as soon as money gets involved. Mm. That's why a lot of us who work in theatre and film will always come back to theatre because, frankly, there's not enough money in theatre for people to limit it too much. And as soon as you're doing something which is worth sort of 20 million pounds, then you can't anymore as an individual really just, no one will trust you to make that thing what you want it to be. Whereas a play, a lot of the time, is a sort of, you know, it's much more of a writer's form. 
I suppose I'm doing it from a different angle, but I, suppose, I mean, this is all huge stuff, so I don't know quite how to formulate it, but I'm thinking Lord of the Flies immediately as a terrible example where you leave children and everything goes terribly wrong. But then I suppose there is this terrible brutish short circuit and or circle where children, of course, are the products of parents of one sort or another. So if they're the product of, you know, of bad parenting or, or you know, they've been family split or whatever's happened or heroin addicted parents or whatever, then you come into the world with a certain legacy and things repeat in a terrible way. So, so there's that going on on one side and how, and, and it's how to somehow break into a sense of turning, I mean, I don't know, somehow breaking that circle. I think that's a different circle going on from the naturally create. If you leave, for instance, I mean, and how prescribed play is, for instance, say we have a playground and the options on a playground are swing, back and forth, da 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 which actually is quite boring after a bit, seesaw up and down, up and down, da 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 and I read this wonderful, I'm sorry, I'm a bit into anarchy at the moment, but I read this man called Colin Ward, who was a sort of town planner, and he was talking, and I think it was probably in Holland, of a playground where they just let the children at it. They gave them lots of stuff, bits of board, bits of tyre, and said, just go away and do what you do. And a lot of people might have thought, oh my God, we can't, because they might hurt themselves, they might do this, other. but they didn't. They just had a brilliant time, and they did it. And I do, th and if you let, I think there's a lot of frustration and anger apart from people who just have terrible lives, just children nowadays who are faced with, you know, this stuff, we talked about this, and just not being allowed to physically go out and play and make a den and, and sort your own stuff out. And yes, you have an argument, it's not the end of the world, you know, fine, sort it out. I sort of think children probably will and do, and I'm, I'm much more creative and imaginative than they're ever given credit for. Uh, but actually that imagination will sort of, die on the bow if it isn't allowed its own natural course and if it's not all focused into sort of sitting still and and passively receiving stuff yeah. sorry <laughs> that by the way what jane said is i think why it's so important to carry on campaigning for creativity in schools. Yes. And I just wanted to make a comment to Polly, because uh, she started off um, asking this very important question, what play is, looking it up in the dictionary, and discovering that it's a pleasurable activity pursued for no purpose. And it was so interesting that following her little instincts along the way out of that definition, she came in due course to a very famous phrase of Kant's, you know, that, uh, that in the aesthetic we pursue uh, purposefulness without purpose. Um, and, you know, you stumbled across this not knowing that it had been at the center of the uh, revival of aesthetics as part of philosophy in the 18th century. It was then taken over by Schiller in order to uh, criticize what he thought of as the, the, the uh, corruption of mankind by instrumental reasoning, which you called neoliberal uh, consumerist stuff, but it's the same idea, and that this is the answer to it, that we should concentrate on those things which are meaningful for their own sake, in which there is purposefulness, but no purpose, the uh, idea that he took from Kant. Uh, and that changed all the philosophy out of that came Hegel's aesthetics, Marx's uh, theory of, uh, of alienation, and just about everything good and bad that happened in the 19th century. So you did really well to come out of a dictionary definition into the heart of uh, Enlightenment philosophy. I just thought I'd make that, that point. Thanks. <laughs>